Well, hi, Roberta. Hi, Kathy Gonkoff. And hi, Roberta hirsch -Pasek. Actually, we've actually had our names mixed up in this way at several conferences, so we thought we'd share it with all of you. We are so delighted to have been given this award among our most distinguished colleagues, many of whom are here today. Thank you so much to the Association for Psychological Science. And today what we want to do is share a talk with you that we called Living in Pasteur's Quadrant, Navigating the Uncharted Waters Between Basic and Applied Research. So everybody is talking about developmental psychology and early education. Either it's child care. Or brain-based education. Whatever that is. Or high quality preschool. Then there's that 30 million word gap. Which is the amount of language difference between what is addressed to rich and poor children. Oh, we have the grade level reading campaign, which is going to ensure that across the nation, every child in third grade will be reading at the third grade level. And STEM or STEAM, science, technology, engineering, and the arts is on everyone's lips. But some of us. Many of us. Are wary about what they're saying. Take Eric Jensen, for example. Eric Jensen, do you know that in 0.38 seconds, you can get 412,000 hits on Eric Jensen for his top 10 brain-based teaching strategies? When we know quite a little bit about the brain yet for its application to the classroom. Oh, oh, there's products like Brainy Baby with the left brain and the right brain. You can buy two separate cassettes. You can throw your money out twice. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> now, at a recent White House conference, Bridging Neuroscience and Learning, we had a huge discussion about how could all these products be out on the market? And they asked a very simple question. Can any of us name one study, just one study, and there were a lot of neuropsychologists there, one study on which these kinds of products might be based? Consensus view, not one. So that doesn't stop anybody <laughs> out there. There are about one million so-called educational apps that will help your children learn everything from math to toenail clipping to second language learning. Now we woke up one day and we said, what, what does it really mean? What does it mean to be an educational? educational educational app. We couldn't quite figure it out because those things that were called educational seem to have no bearing on any of the science that we knew about. So we decided to do something about it. So we wrote a piece with several of our colleagues, some of whom were in the app biz, for psychological science in the public interest, where we gave principles for evaluating apps in the real world. And we hope to influence the second wave of app development. Moving from the Wild West to the second wave, now we have to get to our absolute personal favorite. And here it is. Your baby, baby can, can read. read. Now, we're happy to tell you that one of our colleagues, Susan Newman, just wrote a paper on this. Now, she studied 117 babies aged 10 to 18 months. And she thought, perhaps, if you looked hard enough, you would find something that they were going to learn from this DVD. But didn't happen. Bottom it, line. No, is, no, your, your baby, baby can't, can't read. <laughs> now, at the July 2000 International Conference on Infant Studies, Andy Meltzoff asked what we think is an amazingly important question. This is when all the madness began. Why is our infancy research so misinterpreted by the public? Why do they translate our findings on number to mean babies can do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, and our findings on language to mean babies can learn to read. Well, perhaps, Roberta, perhaps. It's because educational apps and your baby can read are the public faces of our field. The ways in which most of the public, parents, policymakers, and educators access the latest on child development, in other words, the marketplace rules. Our careers have focused largely on conducting what has been called use-inspired basic research in the science of learning. 
and developing platforms that we'll tell you about today for scientific outreach within the science of learning. So we, today we want to give you a talk in two parts. The first is exploring life in Pasteur's quadrant, three examples in language and literacy. And in the second part, we'll talk about leaping beyond the quadrants into the world at large. Let's start with exploring life in Pasteur's quadrant. In 1997, political scientist Donald Stokes wrote a very influential book. He offered a new solution to the tension that arises between basic science and more applied research. This is a tension that has broken up departments of psychology, as we all know. Stokes' vision is represented here. On the one dimension, you see the quest, quest for fundamental understanding. And on the bottom, you see the second dimension, which is considerations of use. Then what he did is he looked for various kinds of scientists. In the upper left, you have somebody who has a very strong quest for fundamental understanding and somebody who doesn't care much about whether it's used or not. And that would be Bohr's quadrant for working in physics. On the bottom right, you have Edison, who is more concerned with bringing us products like the light bulb and the phonograph than understanding the theory behind what he was doing. And in the upper right, you get Pasteur, who went back and forth from the world to the lab and from the lab to the world. Now, many have asked, what would be in that bottom left-hand quadrant? What might live where there is no real quest for understanding and low use? And we have to tell you that David Klar, who first introduced us to this model, has helped us to understand this. Right, Roberta? Yep. It's faculty meetings. <laughs> now, here's another view of Pasteur's quadrant, because for those of you who are awake and aware, you probably already noticed that all the scientists on the previous one were of one gender. Got to so change it. So we're going to change the gender. Uh, in your high basic understanding quadrant is Marie Curie, who literally gave her life for the study of radium. Next to her in the Youth Inspired column is Virginia Apgar, who came up with a test to evaluate the status of newborns. And down on the right is the movie star, Hedy Lamarr, mm. who you might not know invented frequency hopping, which was a good thing to bar the Nazis from winning the war. But we figured out who would be in that lower left-hand quadrant. Tinkerbell. Tinkerbell. All right, there's a psychology version as well, and we fit into that psychology version, we hope. In the high, high, we have Titchener. So Titchener really believed that any research that took place outside the lab was a loss to pure science. He was very much against any kind of application. In the bottom right quadrant, we bring Anastasi who really helped propel our field by moving toward the application of accountability and assessment. And of course, we have our favorite quadrant, the Bronfenbrenner quadrant, <laughs> because Bronfenbrenner informed theory and also urged us to engage in use-inspired research. He was before his time. And Roberta even got the opportunity, didn't you, Roberta? I was his TA. To be a TA for, for Brun from Brenner. Now, what we'd like to do today is to show you what this really can look like if you live in Pasteur's or Brun from Brenner's quadrant. And we're going to show you by giving you some examples in language and literacy. We would have loved to give you our work in early spatial development, but alas, you'll have to come to another talk. Alas, we thought we could fit it all in in just 50 minutes, and this morning we started cutting. OK. <laughs> so let's start with language and literacy. And it starts with a story about some of our recent work in language that itself began in a well-known book called Meaningful Differences in the Everyday Experiences of Young American Children, brought to you by Hart and Risley in 1995. So what they did was chart the language addressed to children in their homes, not the ambient television, which we now know in many homes is on 24-7, but the language addressed to kids. And they looked at three types of families, welfare families, working class families, 
and professional families like all of us. And this work, I should tell you, has also been replicated by many other people in the field today. What did they discover? I think the most shocking news that came out of this study, and that really, talk about a megaphone, went throughout Washington, DC, and around the world, was on the number of words that were heard by children in each of these groups. So per hour, kids who are on welfare heard 616 <coughs> words addressed to them. Working class kids heard double that amount addressed to them. And professional children heard 2,100 words per hour addressed to them. Fairly shocking and became known as the 30 million word gap has appeared on the front page of the New York Times now. And this has a number of far-reaching consequences. For one, it affects young children's vocabulary size. In the professional income group, they turned out at age three to have 1,116 words. The working income group, 749. And in the welfare group, only 525. So why do we care about this? Why is vocabulary so important? There are many reasons. We just give you four. First, verbal IQ correlates with school achievement. Second, reading is parasitic on language, meaning if the purpose of reading is the extraction of meaning from the printed page, if you ain't got the vocabulary, you ain't got the meaning. Language encodes concepts. Parents don't just repeat words to kids. They explain things to children. And finally, language skill even predicts later on to healthcare outcomes. But is it all about the number of words, Roberta, that pass at children's ears? I mean, given the latest interventions that are out there in the world, you would certainly think so. I mean, we've all heard about Providence Talks. It's been celebrated in the news, and it is a really good program, but the emphasis is more talk, more talk. Too small to fail. I just saw a report that came out yesterday. Focus not only on more talk, but mostly on more talk. But even Hart and Risley back in 1995, the brilliant scholars that they were, knew that the quantity of language addressed to children was not enough. Or else you could just put them in front of the TV and turn it on. They'd hear lots of language that way. Wouldn't help them. The quality of the communicative interaction between parent and child really makes the difference. Talk per, when parent talk is contingent and responsive to child talk and to children's focus of attention, that's when they learn language. But somehow that message was getting lost in the popular translation of the science. So on the heels of a number of our colleagues who wanted to look at the quality of the language input as well as the quantity of the language input and building from Lauren Adamson and Roger Bakeman's seminal work on joint engagement, we decided to revisit these questions in our own research and to look at their impact on early language learning. So we asked two questions. First, we wanted to know whether low-income kids who are successful language learners indeed do have a higher quality of communication going on between parent and child than their less able peers. We also wanted to know how important is the quantity of language children here relative to the quality of what we were going to call the communication foundation, that foundation between two people that is built up so that we can look at one another and have a conversation back and forth. So we did a secondary data analysis from the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development Study of Early Child Care and Youth Development. Oh, that's one heck of a term. A longitudinal study of children from 0 to 16 years uh, from varied ethnicities and income groups. We took a portion of that and designed a study to evaluate quantity of language versus quality of language. We decided to examine the quality and quantity by first starting out with this NICHD study. And I'm sorry, let's do this one. All right, so Go, we had uh, 
this, the design of this study was actually pretty cool. So we had one of our co-authors who was in Dallas, Texas, who had access to the tapes from the NICHD study. And she found for us 60 low-income children that she divided by their scores on the Raynell language test. So she had 20 children who were high language scores, 20 who got middling language scores, and 20 who appeared to be struggling language learners. She took these tapes from when the children were three years of age. Now, remember that this was a longitudinal study. So that gives us an opportunity to go backwards in time. And going backwards in time, we could look at the parent-child interactions at two years of age. And at two years of age, we could look at both the quality of that interaction and the quantity of that interaction measured in words per minute. So what did we look at? In quality, the first thing we looked at was something that was called in its fancy name, symbol-infused joint engagement. What that means is the mom and the kid are both looking at a so, toy. So here we go. There we so, go. Ready? Ooh, what's that? Bottle? Drink? What? All right, so as we're both looking at it, both playing with the dyad, we're both engaged. What Roberta did is she popped in a symbol, and the symbol was the word. I was popping in a gesture as if I went to drink. So it doesn't have to be language. It can be gesture as well. Fluid and connectedness of the interaction. Did we have breaks? Did we have stops? Did it look like it really wasn't moving along with some flow? Or did one partner dominate and the other one just sat? Finally, we looked at playful routines and rituals. If they were playing with a book and they picked out the book, did they know what to do with it? Did they hold it upright? Did they turn the pages? Or did they act as though they'd never seen a book before? And the question was, by looking at these very features, by looking under the surface of a parent-child interaction, and by studying these aspects of quality and quantity, could we then predict back to the groups that they would fall in in their language scores a year later when these children were three? We also measured quantity because we were comparing them. So we looked at the number of words the parent addressed to the child during their interaction. So what were the findings? Briefly, the findings looked like this. If we look at the quality of the input, those three measures that we told you about, you can account for 16% of the variability in the three-year-old's language score by looking at the quality measures of that interaction when the children were two. You gain another 10% if you look at the overlap of quality and quantity. So 26% could be predicted by some aspect of the quality of that interaction. Should we ask you to guess how much was uniquely predicted by quantity? uniquely predicted by that which we are spending most of our time doing and talking about in the world today? Answer, 1%. So what's important about this study is that it isn't about poverty. All these children are from low-income homes, and we found that some of the children had fine language outcomes because their parents engaged in quality communicative interactions with them. So fluid and connected conversations, or what we call conversational, conversational duets, duets, require serve and return and return and return. Learning language can't be a solo performance. It has to be parents talking about what kids are interested in. Finally, we talk about this through the metaphor of filling the gap. We know that low-income children don't have as much language, so let's fill the gap. Let's open up their heads and just pour in more words. But instead, we might be better served by talking about building the foundation. And we've been encouraging a lot of policy initiatives now to talk about building a foundation instead of merely filling a gap. So conversational duets, whether during play or reading storybooks, because there's research on that as well, in which the adult says, and what the adult says and does is contingent 
on the child's focus of attention is the nature of the interactions that fuel language growth. We kind of thought this all along. There were bits and pieces in the literature, but now we've really shown that quality matters. Well, shall you jest? We will now move on and show you two other examples that we think really put the nail in the coffin here for quantity. So we did a second study that more closely examined quality as contingent interaction by looking at, of all things, video chats. Why would we use video chats? Wait, wait, Roberta. This is a, this is a really important slide. Uh, I know. This is a really important slide. I know. OK, so go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so that gorgeous baby on the left is my grandchild with whom I Skype regularly. And the adorable one on the right, meet Elena, who while we were sitting here had her three-week birthday. <laughs> so this talk, this part of the talk, will be very comforting to those grandparents who live in different parts of the world than their children. Now you have heard this before, that little people learn best from live interaction and less from television. We even have a term for it. We call it the video deficit. Now we've Up just, till about two and a half. Sorry. We've just suggested to you in the past research study that this contingency is really going to matter. But if contingency really matters, then it might be that you can learn from a video chat. Well, let's check it out. So we looked at the learning of action words, verbs, which we know are difficult for kids to learn. And this is Sarah Roseberry, the first author on the study who's now at the University of Washington. And she interacted with the child over a Skype conversation. She was in another room. She called the child by name to get the child's attention and then showed the baby the action, making sure the baby was paying attention to her. Wow, I'm blicking him. I'm blicking the baby doll. Will you watch while I'm blicking the baby doll? Now I want you to know, this woman has mastered infant directed speech. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right, we trained the words in either live presentations, in video chats like Skype, or on TV. And we tested word learning in 24 to 30 month old children, so two to two and a half year olds in these three conditions. So in the video chat, Condition is, it's as I just described. Sarah interacted with the child in another room. Remember that a Skype conversation takes place on a two-dimensional screen, just like television. But the difference is that she is now being responsive and contingent to the child. We did live interaction. That's with a 3D, real, absolute human being right there teaching the words. And we had a yoked video training condition. So this is when Sarah showed the children a video she made with a different child. So it had exactly the same training on the words, but it was not contingent and responsive to the child. In the test phase, we used a split screen design. And the child would see on one screen the matching action, and on the other screen a non-matching action. Now look carefully at these pictures. You see, they look nothing like Sarah when she is displaying the action. What they are is they're taken from Sesame Street. Thank you, Sesame Street, for sharing these clips with us. But to do this, the child not only has to learn the word, but she has to be able to extend the word to a new instance. That is really learn the word. Let me point out that these actions, although they're static here, were actually dynamic. So the kid could see the actions taking place on both sides of the screen. And we monitor the child's visual fixation. If they look more to the side that matches what they're hearing, we know they learned the word. So the question was, could kids learn the verbs? And was the video chat better than the live or more like the TV condition? Take a vote. OK. All right, how many of you think, by the way, that video chat is going to look more like live? Oh, we have a lot of psychologists in this group. How many of you think that video chat's going to look more like television? You wouldn't admit it, huh? All right, so here we go. <laughs> and here's the answer. Uh, Sarah found that, indeed, if you look over here at the blue line, that's video chat. If you look at the red bar, you see live interaction. And you see on the right the yoked video. So, indeed, in this particular experiment, 
video chat was indistinguishable from live interaction. Isn't that great, grandparents? All right, it's looking good. Well, so, let's, let's look at what we've, what we've got so far. What we have so far is a study that shows you that in parent-child interaction, these kind of contingent responses are really, really important. We also found another case where if you even put contingency on a 2D display like a video chat, what you get is more learning than you would if you had just seen it on a 2D like television that is not responsive. Ah, but there's a huge natural experiment going on. And the natural experiment, you can pull them out of your pocket now if you like, but then right. put them away, right. is your cell phone. So what happens if we disrupt the contingent communication that takes place between parents and children? What happens if random cell phone calls and text messages, as we all experience today, occur during our interactions with our children? We should know. Do these interruptions derail children's word learning? Well, we decided to find out. So we asked mothers to come in and teach two words to their children. They were actually the same two words that we used in the Roseberry study. That means we knew that they could learn both of these words. And in a within subject design, we had the parent teach the child two new words. The reason it was a within subject design is that they experienced an interruption with a cell phone and also teaching a word where there was no interruption. Here's what the design looked like. So the design over here, you can see that in one condition, mom was gonna receive a phone call right in the middle of the first word. So let's imagine now, she's teaching blicking, blicking, oh, I'm blicking. And 30 seconds in, she gets his phone. She picks up the telephone and she chit chats with the experimenter for another 30 seconds. And we asked questions like, did you have any coffee today? Did you have any trouble finding us? You know, and meanwhile, the kid is sitting there in the midst of this interaction where the mom is teaching the word. Then she goes back and she teaches the child for another 30 seconds. That would be word one. She then goes on to word two where it's uninterrupted and she can teach word two frapping to the child without having the cell phone conversation at all. So in the next condition, we had the mother teach the word continuously for 60 seconds. You'll see what this looks like in a moment. And then she received a transitional phone call telling her she was doing great, we were ready for the second word. And then when she started teaching the second word after 30 seconds, the phone rang again and she was again taken away from the task. She hung up the phone and then she went back to teach for another 30 seconds. Now lest you think that what's going to happen here is that moms are just not gonna use the full 60 seconds. They're gonna stop trying to teach the kid. They're gonna use fewer words. Nope. In fact, when they're interrupted, they come back and they almost try to make up for it. And they try to use more words. But in these conditions, it turned out to not be significantly different. Here is what it looks like. This is the yes, interruption. Look, I want to show you something. Look, look what I'm doing to this baby. I'm blicking this baby. What am I doing? Blicking. <laughs> what am I doing with this baby? Blicking baby. You were? Oh. Hello? <laughs> it's going great. There's, there's one new baggies. I had a little bit of a <laughs> <laughs> more. I love this. <laughs> Oh, for sure. Okay. okay. <laughs> there were <laughs> there were thirty lest you think she's alone, this happened all over <laughs> with every one of our little thirty-eight dyads. The kids were twenty-seven point two months of age, so they were, you know, a little bit beyond two years of age. And then we tested their word learning as we had before. On the left hand side and on the right hand side, you can see the child just makes a choice by looking one way or the other. Where's blicking? Can you find blicking? And remember these Where's are dynamic blicking? events. Okay? Yeah. And they make a response. And here are the results. So Jessa Reed was the graduate student on this project, and the question is: did the interruptions affect word learning? The blue bar shows that when word learning was interrupted, kids are at 50% chance for which of the two events they look at when they're asked by name to find it. However, in the uninterrupted condition, whether it occurred first or second, the children learned the words. So 
in the summary for this part of the talk, if there's anything you walk away with, it's that contingency matters. That two studies have shown contingency matter in conversational duets in vivo and over Skype. And a third study turned this on its head and asked what happens if you don't have that contingency. And when you don't have that contingency, bottom line, you don't learn. So the message from Pastor's Quadrant is that if you want to increase children's language, reduce and reduce the 30 million word gap. Focusing on quantity alone is not enough. The quality of, of the adult parent child, child or adult child conversation is what matters. All right, in part one, what we did is we explored what it could be like if you lived your life in Pastor's Quadrant and Brown von Brenner's Quadrant. And we gave three examples from language and literacy. Now, getting these answers and publishing in scientific journals is important. We are thankful. We are thrilled. For, that APS has taken yes. some of our studies. Yes. Um, but we'd like to argue in the last part of our talk that it's not enough to, to live, live inside, inside the, the quadrants. quadrants. So in part two, we want to talk about leaping beyond the quadrant into the world at large and sharing our science. Leaping from Pasteur's and Braun from Brenner's quadrant raises several additional questions that I think as a field we have to grapple with. The first is, when has the field amassed enough gold standard data to share with the public? And the second is, how do we best share the body of evidence in ways that protect the integrity of the science while still informing practice? So on when to share. So many of us are often reticent to put our findings into the marketplace of ideas because we've been trained to be skeptics and we want to run that next experiment and that next control. But we actually know a lot based on strong bodies of data that can be used to inform the public. And in the past several years, what we've done is try to suggest overarching principles that we might draw from a certain area of knowledge. In one, it was in language acquisition, where we came up with six principles that we think capture the current state of the field. And we put these together for the California preschool curriculum framework. It's really exciting, by the way, to use principles, because then it doesn't matter what cultural milieu you are in. In California, we noticed that we were faced with a majority-minority state. And we wanted to be able to use evidence-based research, but it isn't going to be the same if you happen to be from an Asian family or Hispanic family. You might apply these principles differently. So perhaps it's time that we should think about deriving working principles in a number of different areas on how to share our wares. What we talk about is creating edible, edible science. science that is accessible, digestible, and usable. So we're going to talk about how to do that through the dissemination of information and through the dissemination of experiences, which is our new approach to sharing our science. On the dissemination of information, uh, there's some bad news. And it only gets worse. The first bad news is even when you have a really popular journal like Pediatrics, it has been tabulated that a full 17 people read your article. So don't think disseminating <laughs> is happening when you are publishing an article. It's only read in the ivory tower and perhaps by a handful of our colleagues, sorry to say. Now the other bad news is that in the current climate, the gatekeepers are gone. In the olden days, if you had a new finding, you might get called by somebody who was very reputable, who everybody trusted, and who would ask you to comment on the research that you'd just done. Does anybody remember this guy? Does anybody know this guy? <laughs> Certainly people below 25 have no clue who he is, right? So um, on disseminating, disseminating information. information. So instead of trusted gatekeepers like that last guy, today we have blogs, TED Talks, tweets, books. talk shows, books. Uh, we, it, the range is incredible <laughs> for disseminating what people claim, that's the key, our psychological findings. How do we ensure that we have our properly nuanced findings 
and that that's what reaches the audience. And what's our responsibility to work with journalists to get the information to the public when most of us try to avoid talking to journalists? But we shouldn't be doing that anymore. The other thing we'd like to suggest is beyond just sharing information, it's important to disseminate experiences. And by that we mean don't just tell them, show them and involve them. I learned a lot of that from my son, Benj Pasek, who's sitting over here, who works in the theater world. And they say, you don't just tell them. You guys try to tell them too much. That maybe what we ought to be doing is also showing them. So this old aphorism really captures it. Tell me, I will forget. Show me, I will remember. Involve me, I will understand. We argue about that for education as well. We do. we do. So using the findings from psychological science, we have experimented with creating experiences to foster learning for families and kids out in the community. And three examples tell our story. The first one is the supermarket story. The supermarket story was really an extension of some of the work that we had already done and that we've shown you today. How can we increase the amount and quality of parental input in a natural, everyday place? We know it's important for language learning, but how do we get people to do it without being teachy-preachy with parents? So we were inspired by the Foundation for Child Development story of three moms and an eggplant. So we want to introduce you to moms one, two, and three, and how they respond to their children's bid to learn about this object. Here's mom one. Sitting on the shelf. Ready? Ah, ah, what's that? What's that? Never mind. Keeps going. Mom. Ignores the baby's bid. Mom two. Ah, uh, ah, uh, what's that? What's Eggplant. that? Eggplant. And keeps moving. <laughs> mom three. Ah. Uh, Eh, what's that? Oh, 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 here, feel it. That's an eggplant. It's oh. one of our only purple vegetables. Shall we buy it and take? We know this is a lady who lunches. We know that. <laughs> but we could have more conversation with our children in places where we go every day. And that's what we tried to create. Hmm, crazy idea. Is it possible that if you put signs in the supermarket, you could prompt parents to talk more to children in an everyday place that they absolutely just have to go to? Well, let's find out. So we, this is a really high-tech project. Mm -hmm. I want you to be inspired by that. We really do. It, it cost, cost $60, $60 to make the signs. So. We went into supermarkets and essentially turned them into children's museums. We didn't even use that many signs. The first sign they encountered was, talking to your child helps their language grow. Yes, we know that smiling broccoli is ditzy, but it worked. Right. All right. Next, we put up signs throughout the supermarket. Question for your child, what's your favorite vegetable? Or, I'm a delicious apple. Can you find another apple? Now, some days the signs were up. And some days, the signs were down. That was our control. So if you look at the graph, the blue is when the signs are down. And the first two bars on your left show low SES supermarkets. So on the left, you see that there was some talk going on with the signs down. But once we put the signs up, we got a 33% increase in talk between parents and young children. Now, isn't that incredible, guys? And then look to the right at the two bars, the blue and red. That's what happened in the middle, come, middle income environment. Nothing. <laughs> Why? Because when we go to the supermarket with our kids, we talk to them and we explain stuff. So the presence of the signs did not have the same effect on middle class families as it had on lower class families. A second example that you just heard a little bit about earlier was the ultimate block party. In the ultimate block party, the idea was this. I remembered hearing that there was art, an art exhibit, that was in Central Park. And thought to myself, what was wow. That? The gates? gates? Gates, was it? It might have been the gates. And then I said, hmm, maybe, just maybe, we could have science in the park. What would that be like? And Roberta and I developed an idea bringing the science of learning into Central Park in 28 scientists vetted activities, each built from one of your research articles on spatial learning, executive function, literacy, mathematics. And we were supported by the National Science Foundation in part. And we sold absolutely nothing, which was one of the highlights of the event for my daughter-in-law, who's here, Sasha. 
All right, so over here you can just see a couple of the activities. One was the world's largest Simon Says. Now, impulse when you think control. Simon Says, you know it's just a kid's game, right? No, because if we say, put your hands on your head and I haven't said Simon Says, you lose. So children actually learn inhibition or executive function by playing Simon Says. In the bottom left, you see the exhibit by Lego, and they gave us all green blocks. Why all green blocks? Because then if you have only five minutes, whoa, then you have to rotate them. You have to build what you want to build with just one shape. We're moving. And we gave out 16,000 free books that we called playbooks. Thank you, Morris. That had activities in them that we told families they could do when they got home. We said, don't throw out the book. We worked really hard on it. All right, but we're moving on because we only have five minutes. Right. We had over 50,000 participants in New York City with strong showings in later Ultimate Block Parties in Toronto and Baltimore. The reach, 10.2 million people. And that was even before we had a major New York Times article that came that out covered one month the event. later because nobody believed this was going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Being scientists, we also did an evaluation survey with on Rachel Grubb and Mark Schlesinger of Yale, in which we polled people who were at the event and a control group who used Central Park's playground. And we found that the attendees were highly diverse racially and economically, and those who attended more activities came to appreciate more the value of playful learning for their children's learning. All right, so if we only have five minutes, so it's cool to you with you, I'm going to Zoom. Cool? Sure. We're sure. Zooming. Sure, we All right. did this. We so did this. <laughs> All right, so the last one we want to show you is our newest idea that we think is going to be implemented in, um, in the city of Philadelphia, Philadelphia, and we call it Urban Thinkscapes. Here are the ideas to take more everyday places and see if we can transform them into learning cities, or what we're calling smart cities. Here you see one example. This is with our architect, Itai Palti, who is um, from Tel Aviv, Israel, and is a genius. Oh, he's he takes our ideas and somehow molds them into architectural structures. And what we have here on the left is transforming a street light, a simple street light into an experiment in light. And on the right, you see how we can transform a street light so that a child can move a dial and get animation on the sidewalk. I would say keep going. Go ahead, just give the Until puzzle there. bench. So we have this puzzle bench that's at bus stops. And for low socioeconomic status children who may not play with puzzles, this is an opportunity while waiting to interact with their parent, hear language, and interact with the puzzle. So most of the science of learning efforts that are out there are based on school reform. But notice that each of our dissemination experiences engage children and families in the non-school time, the 80% that children are not in school. And we think that each affords researchers the opportunity to do use-inspired basic research. In some, then, the field of psychology is often divided by those who do basic and those who do applied science. But use-inspired research, as in the science of learning, helps us navigate a new road in which our work is relevant to both theory and practice. But doing the science is not enough. Our work is often misunderstood or never know. read beyond our narrow discipline. So our challenge to all of you is to ask how you can go beyond Pastor's quadrant and leap out to help families, policymakers, and educators understand the wonderful body of research we do produce. In fact, at the International Congress of Infant Studies, we're thinking about a model where our organization might offer fellowships that twin researchers with journalists to help build the next generation of disseminators. We hope that you will join us in thinking about new models for our field so that scientists can put the data in the hands of the people. <laughs> APA President George Miller, 1969 in his presidential address, said, let's give psychology away. That was his fondest dream. To help you take the challenge, we also invite you to send articles into a special issue bringing developmental science into the world that we're going to be doing with child development applications are due in just two weeks on June 1st. So we hope you will take the challenge with us and follow us on Twitter. 
And now we get to our thank yous. So we're almost at the end. Thanks for bearing with us. First, we want to thank our amazing husbands. We want to thank our children, our unwitting subjects through the years. We learned so much from you guys. Thanks to APS. Wow, this is just so cool to get this award, and we really feel honored. And the Temple Infant and Child Lab. And the Child's Play Learning and Development Lab at the University of Delaware. The families and children who schlepped to our labs to participate <laughs> in our research. The many organizations who have supported us through the years. And Deb and Stan, thank you so much for your support over the years. And the Unidel Foundation. We really, really appreciate being here and sharing our passion and our message with you. And thank you so much for coming.